Hey everybody, this is Seth Kniep, Kniep in It Real. I am very honored to have Philip here with us today. Philip, thank you so much for being here for this live interview. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. And guys, just so you know, Philip works with Freitos. They have 100 people on their team. They're in six different locations around the world and they specialize in shipping. And I just did a fun little quiz right before and I was like, okay, I have to ask these questions, Philip. And I took them through all the most crazy out there INCO terms I could think of, from CFR to CIF to CPT to CIP to DDU to DDP to DAT to FOB to FCA, all of them. And he's like, oh yeah, I know this one. I know this one. So <laughs> we are talking to the right man. Um, as you guys have known, many of you know, probably the two biggest, most difficult challenges for Amazon sellers, especially if you're new to selling on Amazon, is PPC ad advertising can be a beast and it can be confusing and difficult, and shipping. Shipping can be also confusing and difficult. So that is why I love bringing in specialists who know a lot more than I do about a certain topic and they can help you understand and I learn as well. So guys, this is a really fun interview because we're just gonna ask Philip a bunch of questions to help us understand. And Philip promised me that there's no question he can't answer. <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see. Hey, challenge accepted. <laughs> well, um, I like to put on the pressure, as you know. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Philip, can you tell us how did you get involved with Freitos? How did you enter the whole shipping industry? How did you end up where you are today? Well, just you know, like a two-minute version of that story. Very nice. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been in the industry for uh, close to fifteen years and started off with uh, selling freight. You know, like as uh, to with a freight for water um, off off the bat. But but um, along the lines, I always thought there must be something better. You need to you purchase everything online. Um, you 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 purchase your taxi online, your food online, everything online. Why can't you purchase freight online? And so um, I had this idea about three four years back, and then. Um, Freitas came along, um, which has a very well funding. We're at the moment the largest uh, freight uh, marketplace out there, uh, where you can compare different freight for waters, like a kayak, like an Expedia, um, and it's super convenient. So um, that's why I'm at Freitas, and uh, we all love uh, love to drive uh, the freight forward. Very cool. That's amazing because when you talk about freight forwarding, most people don't understand it at all. Like I know one of the biggest questions I have when I start Amazon is, what's the difference between a carrier and a freight forwarder, do they overlap? Are they the same thing? Can you help clear that up for us, Philip? Very simple. Um, a carrier would be something like an American Airlines, why a freight forwarder would be the one who's organizing it. It's like a travel agency you book from. Um, but that's, in most terms, the freight forwarder doesn't. So in your guys' situation, you aren't technically the freight forwarder. You're like the organizer to put it all together to simplify the process, is that correct? Exactly. We're like a we're like a kayak uh, for freight, where you go and compare different freight for waters and different ca carriers. Um, and it's uh, it's not only for the price comparison. Uh, one thing that is very very typical in uh, in freight for watering is is that um, you get a quote, but later on what you get billed very often is not what you got quoted because things changed. Um, also, obviously, like uh, the freight for water has an interest to improve profits. Um, and uh, not to pound too much on freight for waters, but uh, obviously there, if, if you have someone who's an expert in freight for watering, which is the freight for water, and who's someone who's not an expert in freight, um, you're always in a little disadvantage. That's why at Freitos, we not only compare freight costs, but also we make them very transparent to you, so you can compare truly A to B to C. And that brings up a really important question that we briefly discussed before, and that is, what about all those hidden costs? When so, especially if someone's shipping by sea, and they're not doing deliver duty paid. And by that, deliver duty paid, everyone, we just mean when you pay them and they take care of everything all the way to your doorstep or to Amazon so you don't have to worry about filling out these customs forms. So if you do shipping by sea, a lot of times it's a little more complicated. The first time I did it, it went to a port on the West Coast in the Los Angeles area. Then we had to get a, a truck to ship to bring it to a warehouse. Then I had to sign a document. Then they had to deliver, use FedEx to deliver it to here. I mean, it was a long process. Mm -hmm. so how do you know? if a supplier is trying to cheat you or screw you over by adding in fees for shipping. I think that's one of the biggest fears. How do you do that? Because there's so many little fees like, oh, there's a, you know, uh, in case you get an inspection, there's a fee. Oh, there's an opening the cart fee. Like it seems almost infinite. And half the time people don't understand the acronyms that are attached to those fees. 
Yeah, yeah, that's very common. It's it's a, it's a, 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 not only the some fees are complete standards but unknown. Um, some other fees are not unstandard. Uh, um, I yesterday had the case. Someone was asking me a one touch fee. I've never heard about a one touch fee, <laughs> um, but but it's a great new acronym. So so always question behind. I mean, they are great sources. We publish them um, also in the internet. They're great sources out there for standard fees. Um, what um, uh, what Freitas does, for example, when you have a freight quote. Um, you see the different line items included, and you see what's 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 common. Um, there is no general answer in terms of like these are the three fees that are in there. Um, but I always expect um, that there are fees um, that are passed through, meaning that fees that the uh, freight forwarder pays to the carrier, and then um, fees that are usually um, bundled in documentation and handling. Um, that is the true profit. Um, to the freight for water uh, that basically for handling and do uh, creating these documents. Um, so there is uh, there is no general answer. However, um, you should always question uh, what these fees are. And when the answer it doesn't sound like quite right, um, ask double behind it. Um, don't just accept the fees that are uh, that you get quoted from uh, from the freight for water or later on charged. So is it a good idea if you're talking to a supplier and they give you these charges? These let's just say you know we're going to ship I don't know um, deodorant. <laughs> we're going to ship deodorant, and let's just say we're going to do, you know, 4,000 of them, and they're telling us that the shipping is going to cost, you know, $1,500 total or something like that. And so we get back and say, okay, $1,500. Is it a good idea to go to another supplier to compare shipping? Is that a helpful way to make sure we're not being cheated? Yes, you definitely want to compare. Um, the the variance is quite large. Um, do not only just rely on on one. Um, especially what we recommend is you mentioned TDP. Um, I would ask the freight uh, the, the supplier in China and ask them what would it cost um, if you get charged X works, uh, meaning that you are in full charge for the freight terms. Uh, for the freight cost and for the transportation, or FOB, which is the second most common term, which means free on board, that the provider, uh, the supplier in China or wherever you import from, um, is bringing everything to port, is paying for the export uh, customs clearance and the export charges, and then everything from on board, meaning when it's on the vessel or when it's on the uh, on the plane, uh, you are taking care of it, so that you can compare basically what would it cost. The landed to true landed cost for you, um, fully paid by the supplier, and just the cost for the product, and you take over the for the logistics. Um, it's not only a cost difference. The difference is also that when you take over logistics, you have more control over it, um, right. simply because you know whom to deal with. Um, you've been in touch with the parties before. Yes, it sounds a little bit more complicated in the upfront that you have to do more work. But look, if if the if the goods are delayed by 10, 15 days. And you, you are simply the receiver. Um, then very often the freight forwarders will go back and say, "Look, uh, you are just the receiver. Um, if you want to talk, uh, if you want to change anything, you have to go back to your factory." Then you have a twelve-hour time difference if you're in the East Coast, for example. It's just because cumbersome, and we've learned over time that basically, if an inco term starts with an E or an F, um, like FOB or X Works, um, then it's usually much easier for the ones importing. Okay, so let me make sure I understand. You mentioned X Works. And if I understand this correctly, XWorks is where the entire responsibility is put on me, the buyer. So I'm responsible to set up the insurance. Um, the transfer responsibility goes to me at their factory, right, Philip? Yes, that's correct. So XWorks is truly you pick it up from their ramp. Right. And the moment the goods are rolled into the truck um, from their ramp, the responsibility and all the freight and, and cost is on your side. So the customs, the clearance, the duties. Um, mm -hmm. Getting the freight from the factory to the origination port, from there onto the ship or where the plane, from there to the uh, destination port, from there to the final destination, that's all on me. So what okay. you're saying, and I want to make sure I understand correctly, if I get a quote for them for XWorks, that helps me to know they're not cheating me on the price because it's all on me. Then if I compare that to where the more the responsibility is on them, it gives me a better – were you saying that or were you saying just go with XWorks instead? No, I mean some. Some. Uh, I mean, I'm not generally saying that factories are cheating, right? So most right, of them right. are pretty honest and and uh, are are very good suppliers in China. Um, so there's a vast majority. But yeah, but you always want to compare. You always want to have options, right? So when you get a DDP, DDP price, then uh, always compare it to ask for an X Works price where the freight is not in, and then just branch out to a freight for water, go to Freightos, and just compare uh, what the freight cost will be. 
And then you see uh, if you add both up your export charges plus the freight cost versus basically the DDP cost if there's a large variance or not. Um, so um, and and uh, when you when you see that there's, it's very similar uh, the price, I would always go with the um, with X Works that it, you pay the price simply because you are in charge um, and in full control over the freight, and that is is incredibly important, especially when it comes to delays in any kind of communication. Where is my freight? That you actually are the one that ordered it and not the factory. Gotcha. Okay, that's really helpful. That's very smart. I'm going to take a moment and just greet some people here. In the chat room um, right now, we have 111 people watching. So I want to welcome everyone. I want to say hello to Robin. Hello to Entrepreneur Rob. That's a cool name. Um, <laughs> and hello Amanda. Hello Fateh. Hello Ray. Hello Itzak. Avinash. Yanif. Um, Entrepreneur Rob again. How are you doing? Hello Palavi. I just sent you an email back this morning. Um, hello Scott. Hello Brent. Hello Pranita. Hello Emilons. Demetrius. Margaret. Ronnie. M Y R. Mike. Lou, Gourmet, Bethany, Dollar, Jessica, Matt, um, so many people here. Good, great to see you guys. And I hope that in this interview, we can help answer some of you guys' most important questions. So what I'm doing is I'm going to scroll up to, I believe Chris had a really solid question. Okay, so here's a really good question, Philip. Chris says this, do any freight forwarders have connections with Chinese suppliers? And what would the criteria be to choose a freight forwarder? Yeah, so the, the, there are two types of forwarder basically to, 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 to split. One is basically the freight forwarder who's, who's mainly based in China um, and then has an agent here in the U.S. who is arranging all the uh, delivery. And another one is based in the U.S. who has an agent in China and uh, arranging um, anything. And what we've seen is, especially someone who's relatively new in shipping, that it's, it's, it's a little um, more convenient to have the main freight for water in the US. Um, there are very good freight for waters in China, especially um, and very, very fast, very, uh, very fast responding. Um, however, when it comes to an agent in the US, um, then basically they're just the agent. Right, they are they are not your main they are not your main counterpart, and so um, uh, it, it it's a it's better to choose um, that's one uh, decision criteria. The second thing is that what we've learned is that especially when you're you always want to be at eye level when you are um, relatively new to shipping or compared to like a Walmart or an IKEA importing like five hundred thousand or more containers a year, um, right. you are you are to like these large type enterprise uh, forwarders. You are somebody like a small importer, um, and so you want to be at par. I'll be, tiny. I'll be so, tiny would be a better word. <laughs> <laughs> so so. Um, what we've seen is that the small fall waters actually deliver the better customer service to smaller shippers versus because there there is truly like a personal relationship and they are used to like all these needs um, and uh, basically they they know the questions that are coming up. Yeah. Um, so not not generalizing and saying large fall waters are not that great. Um, right. We've seen basically that um, that that a small fall water is probably the better better uh, for you. So FedEx, UPS, and DHL, those would be considered big forwarders, right? Yeah, FedEx, DHL, and UPS are so-called express um, or integrators. Um, they are very, very, they obviously do also freight, um, but their main product, what they're famous for, is everything up to 70 pounds. Everything that you can basically carry by hand. Okay. Um, and usually if you ship one, two, three packages. Okay. Uh, however, if, and just real quick, don't mean to interrupt you, I just want to make sure I, yeah. I understand so everyone's following. If I'm shipping a whole bunch of deodorant <laughs> okay, overseas, um, I'm shipping this, and I have you know two containers of it, multiple pallets. That wouldn't it would FedEx wouldn't do that, or they could, but they're just maybe not be the best option because that's not their specialty because it's so large and it's shipping by sea. Am, am I correct in that? Yeah. So this comes basically to what shipping costs, right? So I mean, this is like, um, and and the larger it gets. Obviously, the there is there is a there you always have a toggle between speed and cost, right? right? So right. Um, a larger different, differentiator is basically when you have a small box, um, um, then basically ocean freight, especially ocean freight, has a lot of fixed costs. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't really matter if you ship one pallet, three pallets, or five pallets. The incremental costs um, are compared to the fixed costs in, uh, minimal. It then obviously adds up if you have several containers, and then basically it just doubles. 
But, but so what we are saying is that if you ship up to up to 100 pounds, you probably go with an express, uh, express provider like FedEx, UPS, um, DHL. Gotcha. If you ship up to 500 kilograms uh, or is it uh, probably around 1,000 pounds, then basically air freight is probably the better, uh, better service because um, there the fixed costs are, are relatively uh, minimal compared to ocean freight. You still have a fast service, and they are truly the cost is variable per kilogram. However, wow. when you go over a thousand pounds, then you probably go with uh, with ocean freight because then you see yes, it takes longer, but then your incremental cost, you're at a cost range where you truly see an advantage over air or a courier. Okay. And um, but obviously you have to also also take the timeline into consideration because air freight takes five to eight days. Versus basically ocean freight, depending where you are, can twenty to forty days and take right. twenty to forty days. I'm going to go through that again to make sure we're tracking. Mm -hmm. So, general advice: obviously, there's exceptions. I know that, but from zero up to about seventy pounds, it's best to go with an express shipping service like DHL, FedEx, or UPS. Correct? Yes. Okay. And then if I'm going higher than seventy pounds, again, these are general rules, guys. Don't consider these like, oh, this is hard and fast. It's going to depend on stuff. But seventy pounds up to about a thousand pounds. I should go by plane, by air. Yes. Yep. And when you say air versus express, because I know both are in an airplane, help us understand <laughs> what's the difference. Are we talking about a faster airplane, one of those huge airplanes for more regular air? What's the difference? Philip? Well, the one UPS, DHL, FedEx are basically the, 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 the brown, yellow, or uh, white, purple colleagues that are picking well, up. They're marketing themselves well because you just identified them by their color. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, so these these are the guys that are um, integrators, meaning they they're coming at your to your to the factory. You get a label, you put the label on the package, and they are transporting the entire goods, the entire package through their chain and delivering it. But versus with the air freight, um, the goods are loaded on a passenger jet, and you would believe that about fifty percent of world air freight is transported in the belly of a passenger jet. Really? So I did not know that. Wow, so this is still people. So when I take yeah. when I fly to Seattle next week, I'm speaking at a conference here. When I'm sitting in that airplane, below there could be some goods that Amazon. Well, in this case, not obviously, but it's international. But you know what I mean. Below in the in the bottom, there could be. Yeah. When you're when you're early in the plane and you're traveling internationally, you've probably seen it that uh, there is this like uh, there's this called cookie sheet. It's a limit uh, sheet, and over it is a net, and this is basically general air freight that's okay. transported. Okay. This is really interesting. So let me go back. So zero to seventy pounds, general rule, guys. FedEx, DHL, UPS, really helpful. That's express shipping. Then air freight is a passenger plane, right, Philip? That's, and that's, that's around. Yeah, yeah. go okay. ahead. And that's it's around good. 70 pounds to up to 1,000 ish is really good. Now, here's the question though. I, you mentioned once I go beyond 1,000 pounds, it's probably better to go by sea. A lot of suppliers, they really push the sea shipping. They say, no, it is, it is cheaper, it is cheaper, it is cheaper, it's better price. But if you're doing a low quantity, it's not better price because the customs, the import fees, the tax, the duties, all of those, are, they counteract. Even though the actual shipping charge is lower, all those other fees come into play. It ends up being more expensive. So if I go by air freight between 70 pounds and 1,000, as a general rule, Philip, is that price higher or lower than if I went from 70 pounds to 1,000 by ship or by air freight? Or are they around the same, but the difference is air freight's obviously faster. Like, yeah, so it's it's always a game where you're going to um, in the United States, but usually right. air freight is there a little cheaper because um, the truck, especially if you go to the to the to the um, center of the country, um, it, the the last mile is by truck, and there the fixed costs are pretty high. Yes. So um, always compare it. I mean, at Freightos we have a tool we we just can play around with basically what's cheaper. Um, yeah. Just compare it. Um, and 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 get a bunch of quotes in. It's better to be informed before than afterwards. Uh, but we've seen that is the general rule. There is one more trick um, I think that's very helpful for your uh, for for your community is that um, if you're shipping by UPS, DHL, or Express, mm -hmm. and your goods are under two and a half thousand dollar worth two two and a half thousand dollar, then um, you can do a, or the customs broker can do a simplified entry in the United States, which means that you do not need a customs bond. And right. the customs bond is, is worth freight around $50. In ocean freight, you need an additional one, which is called ISF bond. So it's in total $120, $125. So you can save this $125, right? Uh, yeah. then you had this question probably, and uh, I'm stealing your questions here, but. <laughs> but <laughs> 
So basically, if your goods are a value, and what's the value of the goods? That's what on the commercial invoice that the factory is giving you, um, is charging you. If this is below two and a half thousand dollar, and you go by express, you do not need this bond. Okay. Hey, if you don't mind me saying asking something completely out of the blue, I'm trying to identify your accent. It's very slight, and I can't name it. And usually, I'm pretty good. Can you help me understand what is the accent? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from I'm from Germany. Uh, okay. Yeah. I should know this because my last name is Kniep, K-N-I-E-P, and I am German, like 90%, 95%. Most people think I'm Scottish, even though I got red hair, I am German. And um, sprechen Sie Deutsch. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the name Kniep actually means maker of knives. So apparently, my ancient ancestor made knives for a living. I think that's pretty cool, and I like to brag about it. So I decided to show that. <laughs> that brings us back to great. When you're shipping knives and there's some <laughs> other product. That was very loaded. smooth, brother. Oh. <laughs> 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 Uh, then you need to be a little careful um, about what kind of products you're bringing in uh, because you wouldn't know that some are actually restricted. Uh, we just had a case, for example, of colored uh, pencils, um, and uh, there is uh, there um, there's a very very high duty uh, on colored pencils. It's about 110 percent of the goods wow. of the value. So you wanna you wanna Google it a little bit before. Uh, Freitas also has a has a has a calculator for your. Um, for the duties that you pay, uh, but it's not only the duties. Um, it is, for example, if you bring in leather goods, are um, there are uh, there are um, uh, there uh, there are some restrictions around from the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, if you're bringing on, you wouldn't know, for example, sunglasses. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is regulating them uh, simply because you wear them close to your eye, and so even if you bring like cheap uh, eyewear, uh, I mean, sun summer is almost over, but in winter you still need it, right? Um, <laughs> and and so um, Google before uh, what you're bringing in, uh, simply because you really want to be informed before. It doesn't hurt to ask. Your factory usually knows about it. Um, right. Don't just like um, get into it. Well, when you say Google. It, that makes me nervous because, I mean, I'm going to go to Google. There's a lot of helpful information and there's also a lot of crappy information. Does Freitos tell me when I drop in the in the information? Does it? Do I tell them the kind of good I'm considering shipping, and it will tell me the fees based on the kind of good? Does it go that far, or do I need to make a phone call to Freitos, or do I need to call someone else? Yeah. So so um, no, we do not tell. Depend on the kind of of the commodity. This is the term, right? Um, we do not do this, and uh, the reason behind it is that it gets it gets into uh, customs regulations, and um, neither Freitos them um, or any other side are are um, are registered or uh, a customs broker, licensed customs broker. So we are legally not allowed to give any advice in terms of like you should use um, this code or you're not allowed to import this or so. Um, but usually, especially when you Google, um, there are um, there are great um, advisors. There's one side called uh, FDA attorneys um, that can, for relatively affordable uh, amounts, give you an advice if anything is uh, if you are importing anything that might be FDA regulated, um, and and um, also licensed customs broker. If you Google for them, um, we can also provide you with some. They give you advice, a detailed advice um, on how much the duties will be and so on. Okay, interesting. This is super helpful. I'm going to jump back to the questions. Um, let's see. Entrepreneur Rob says this: If I never had problems with my samples being delivered to my house, why would there be a problem with shipping a few more to my house? What are your thoughts on that, Philip? Usually, if you never had any any uh, any issues, then you sh I mean, I, I I don't say you shouldn't have any. Right. Um, the only thing is basically, I mean, problems is a very wide term. Um, it can also be that when you ship in one pallet in a container, that not that not your your pallet piques the interest of customs, but another pallet in the container, and so they seize the entire container and do a customs inspection. Mm -hmm. So um, then it can take from a few few hours to actually a few days um, for it, and you're paying basically the fees for uh, for this uh, for this inspection. Um, but but so never say never. But um, if you if you never had any issues with samples, I wouldn't be too worried. Gotcha. Okay. And I think maybe part of the question is coming from this, where when we request samples, they'll ship at DHL, FedEx, UPS. But then when we buy a large container, they're now talking about a different shipping service. So maybe that's part of it too. Mm -hmm. uh, how often? And this question came up. Should someone hire a customs broker? And you did mention once it's over 2,000 value, 
that's where you need a customs broker, correct? Yeah, over two and a half thousand, yes. Two and a half thousand. Okay, so over twenty five hundred dollars, you need a mm -hmm. customs broker. Um, you need a customs broker. Yeah, and, and if it's not shipped with Express. If it's right, because Express takes care of that's part of the deal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like FedEx has their own internal custom gotcha. Mm -hmm. How often should I hire one independently versus getting a company that includes that in the process? What do you think? Most most freight forwarders are also licensed customs brokers. I wouldn't I wouldn't go to a separate service. Okay. Um, it's much much easier if you have the, the same company, and you wouldn't even be able to tell um, that um, that you that there are two different services. Gotcha. That's so it's basically very streamlined. It's very smooth. And I've heard, and in my experience, this has been true because I've tried both. It actually cost me more when I hired a customs broker than when I did the entire thing through a freight forwarding service and it included that. Which maybe that's because they get a discount or something because they're also doing the shipping. Mm -hmm. um, question for you, Philip. If I use Freytos and I go in and I put in whatever I need, how do you guys get paid? And how, and how much more am I paying to use your service? What is that like? What makes you guys competitive and stand out versus, you know, well, I don't want to pay extra fee. I'd rather just go find someone that, you know, my supplier recommends. What are your thoughts on that, man? Yeah, so um, what we do is uh, we offer this, uh, we offer, uh, it's, a, it's a marketplace, and we offer freight for waters that they promote their rates um, on market, uh, on Freightos, where a lot of shippers are coming from a day-to-day -day basis. So we're taking a small percentage from the freight for waters um, that, um, that they can offer their services on Freightos. Um, and, uh, but we do not charge anything to you guys, the shippers, Wow. Um, it's free to sign up and it's free to use. Um, and very often we find that because you can compare one freight forwarder straight to the other, um, down to the penny, um, and, and 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 choose. You have reviews on from other shippers like yours and see what they said before. Yeah. So very often we see that not only they're more we are more competitive than when you go out to like a X Y Z forwarder, but also that um, we're more convenient because you have a direct comparison. Nice. That's amazing. So basically, if I use your service, you're not charging me. I'm not paying more to use your service. The way you guys get funded is you're being paid by the freight forwarder because you're bringing them business. You're bringing them my business. So I don't. it doesn't cost me any more. And when I put in the information, I can compare it to all the different freight forwarders, correct? That is correct. Yeah, you can compare different large freight forwarders. We just give you a description of, about the freight forwarder. Um, the reviews from uh, we have we, we really do not influence the reviews. This comes straight from the shipper. Um, so so that's we a true platform, a true marketplace there, like a kayak for for freight. Wow. And do you guys help me with the process as I go through it, or do I more get the quote, choose a freight forwarder, and then I work with the freight forwarder from then on? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, so so you book the freight through us. Um, we'll guide you through basically the booking, um, and then we'll get you in touch with the freight for water. And the freight for water, you're not the first buyer from the freight for water uh, or, or or shipper with the freight for water. They know who's coming uh, from Freightos. Um, they have all your details, all your information we provided uh, we provided to them. Um, so they know exactly like um, you, you're you're basically coming into into a hotel room, and you know uh, that you're a hotel guest. Uh, they're not looking at you, saying like, "Who is you? Who are you?" And uh, so, 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 um, you will be in touch with a faithful water, but you're not the first one. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Krista asked a question. I'll answer this question. She says, "I'm about to ship my product very soon. I'm really torn on whether to ship it straight to Amazon or not." So, Krista, it depends on a couple things. If you want to, if you already saw samples of the product, if you have a lot of trust in the supplier, and you are comfortable with them then you can have them ship it directly to Amazon's warehouse. Just make sure they print the FNSKU label as part of the label on each package so that Amazon can correctly place it in the warehouse and you get credit for it when it sells. sells. However, if it's your first shipment, you may want to have them ship it to you the first time so you can check everything, test everything, understand, even keep some of it with you for launching it if you're going to ship out FBM to launch it and get reviews. And then the rest of it you can ship into Amazon FBA. The way we do it is we always have it shipped to our place first. Then once we trust them more, we move to having them ship directly to Amazon's warehouse. So I hope that is helpful, Krista. Um, another question, Philip, is Mike says, I have orders from multiple suppliers. Does the $2,500 limitation apply to each individually or my shipment as a whole? It's a great question. <laughs> um, I mean, if you have multiple suppliers and you're shipping by express, 
um, then you do not consolidate these, uh, these, these suppliers. You ship them all separately. Um, so, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, ship the goods within China from one place to the other and then pack a package together that is worth $2,500 and then ship it over with UPS. Um, so, uh, but, but to answer this question straight, um, it, applies, uh, it applies to each commercial invoice, meaning that um, if you have two commercial invoices, you have two entries, and then basically it applies to each, each purchase that you make. So what if someone said, you know, I have $5,000 of goods, would it make sense to separate it into two 2500s? So it's two entries, is that worth it or I'm probably end up paying more in shipping anyways? Exactly, I mean, you always have to see what you pay in shipping more and compared to what you save uh, with that, then shipping, it's, it's not worth it. Right, okay. And something to keep in mind too, um, Mike, is you can use a fulfillment service, there's many of them, where they will take all the goods into one place for you and ship it all together if you prefer that. In other words, it's a third party, so there's no conflict of interest. The suppliers don't know what the final product is, therefore they're not gonna be putting that on Alibaba and Amazon as likely, and they can bring them together at their place and then ship it directly. But like um, Philip said, once you're beyond the $2,500, then um, the, you have to have more customs to pay to get that through. Um, here's another question, Philip. Lorena says, if I go with a vendor from Peru and not China, is it harder or more expensive? Do you have any info on importing from Peru? No, it's, it's um, yeah, we, we don't have imports from Peru um, that, that often. I mean, China is truly like the country everyone is importing from, right? Um, but we do have it uh, also from, from other countries in Southeast Asia, um, you know, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and so on. Um, there, is, um, there is not much difference. Um, the only thing that might be different is that the customs duties depend on which country you import from. So you right. want to know this basically before. Um, and then there are here and there, there are specialties in terms of, um, the specialties in, in, in terms of what, what products are allowed to be brought in or not. It's also customs regulated. Okay. And when you first have that product produced by the factory, is it is it better, do you think, to have the supplier handle the shipping for me? I just pay them that three, four thousand, whatever dollar fee, and they take care of all everything DDP. Or would you say it's better to just have them make it? It's sitting there, kind of like X works, right? And then I go and find a freight forwarder and have them do it. What are the pros and cons of those two scenarios, Philip? I mean, the the good thing is um, when you have samples, you want to samples. You don't want to only try out the product, but you also want to try out how shipping works. Right? right. So why would you why would you uh, do everything and then basically switch the shipping later on? Um, try out the because then you truly have time, right? With a sample still, um, you you don't have these uh, uh, out of stock pressure. Um, then try out directly how you want to ship it in future. Okay. And it it's, it really doesn't matter, especially with small boxes, um, to send the factory a label that they attach to a uh, to a box. They they do it and then it's a full full you full control. Okay. And uh, KB1, I'll answer this question, says, is the value of the products the price I paid for the products or the actual value of the products themselves, like the cost of manufacturing the products? So KB, it's a really good question because value is always determined by context. It's the whole arbitrage idea. So, you know, what could be, I'll use the deodorant examples again, what could be, you know, 30 cents in China, the value for the exact same thing could be $3 in the U.S., so when, they, when the supplier gives you a quote and they say, hey, you want deodorant? It's gonna cost you 30 cents a piece. That's the value. They're determining that's the value for you. You could go to another supplier who also makes the same thing and maybe they give you 29 cents a piece but you have to buy a greater quantity. See what I mean? So there's no direct answer to that. And let me know if that answers your question. However, let's take it one step further. If this question's related to custom, so for example, Philip, you're probably thinking this already, if I have my deodorant and I'm having it shipped over here, how do we determine the value if it's 2,500 or more? I have had some suppliers say, hey, you know, we'll market at this value, but I know I'm paying more than that value. First of all, that seems a little shady, a little risky. What are your thoughts on that? And second, how do we determine that value so we know whether or not we have to worry about the customs? Very simple. Um, you get an invoice from the factory. Uh, it says 2,000 or it says 3,000, and that's the value of the goods. Uh, it's whatever you pay to the factory. Got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. What if what if what if they go? Hey, we'll drop the price a little bit. What do you think of that? 
They've done this. They'll, they'll ask, they'll say, we're going to say the value is lower than what we paid, so we don't have to deal with that customs issue. Well, it's, it's A, it's not a customs issue. I mean, importing into the United States, uh, customs is not creating an issue. It's basically just regulating uh, what's being brought into the country. Um, right. and, and, and it's not, it's 99.9% it's, it's .9 of the goods are just passed through. You wouldn't even know that they were through customs. The only difference is that on one side you need a bond, on the other side you don't need a bond. And when you're importing larger quantities, you anyhow need a bond. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, and the only difference is basically um, for air when you uh, do express or air freight, it's fifty dollar, um, or if you do ocean freight, around one hundred twenty-five dollar. So that's the only difference. I wouldn't scare uh, away from like, oh, it has to be under two and a half thousand dollar. It's it's truly like it's it's you wouldn't even notice except this little difference that you pay for the customs bond. It's it's, it's minimal. Yeah. Um, so um, don't don't be this. Don't try to engage in anything that is like gray zone with a factory um, <laughs> uh, just because you want to circumvent it. It's so easy. Millions of people are doing uh, have done this, and thousands of new FBA shippers are doing this on a on a on a monthly basis. So right. uh, don't scare away. Yeah, very good. And by bond, you mean insurance, right? Government insurance that protects me. If for some reason, we don't pay the fees. That insurance protects us. It's sort of like liability for the government, correct? It's it's a yeah, it's a liability from the governments that you or from from the uh, government agencies here specifically the the customs um, the customs authorities okay. um, that you do truly pay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Kenny says, how do I get a customs bond when living in Europe, and I don't have business friends or family in the U.S. What are your thoughts, Philip? The bond is actually, it, it, it's the easy part. It's basically that you need a, a representation in the United States um, as, as, a, as a, a either residence or, or a legal entity. Um, and there are providers out there. You can either approach us or you can also Google for a legal representation. It's around $70 per shipments that they charge if you do not have representation in the US. Um, that it's usually like a, a lawyer that re represents you when shipping into the United States. And if we're using a freight forwarder, that include they can also include that service for us, right? If we're using certain freight forwarders, that's part of it. Exactly, exactly. These freight forwarders then work with uh, a company that uh, that uh, represents shippers. Um, I would do it like at the beginning just to try it out. However, if you do it on a continuous basis, um, it is relatively easy. And also, we have material on this um, to set up um, yourself as a foreign Im uh, importer, get a get an um, get a tax ID as a foreign importer. It is not very difficult to do this in the United States. Very good. Thank you, Philip. Um, Tom Billick says this, does airship take around five to eight days? And my understanding is express is usually a week. So is air freight longer than that usually? Like how long does it usually take? It's a little longer simply because the, um, the, the processes are, are slightly different. Um, so in an air freight shipment, the goods are, aren't being picked up by the company, by American Airlines or United. Uh, they are being picked up by a trucker that is engaged by the freight for water, um, then brought to a warehouse, then combined with other shipments, brought to the airline, and then shipped on, on the reverse, basically on the, other, on the back side, on the delivery side. So it takes usually a little longer. Um, I mean, it, it, uh, a, that, uh, that uh, UPS, DHL, or FedEx takes a week that is truly like from ordering to delivery. Um, right. Usually it's faster. Um, and the F rate is five to eight days, sometimes it's 10 days. Uh, depends on where it's going to. If if you're in the middle of the country and there's no large airport around, then it takes a little longer than when you're in the vicinity of Los Angeles where you have like daily flights coming in from China. Gotcha, okay. And here's another question, Philip. Uh, T. Drew says this, if I'm using a freight forwarder to pick up from the manufacturer, does that mean I would be shipping FOB? And, and T. Drew, just to make sure clarity here, FOB is for C sh shipping only. But does that is that what that means? So if he's used the freight forward to pick it up, is that considered FOB, or is FOB simply just you know they get it on board and then everything else is your responsibility? FOB, yeah, FOB in, in true is like for for ocean shipping, but it's used for air and anything else. It's it's basically just it's a, the, the the term is a little misused, um, but because everyone it's, everyone is using it, it defines basically itself, right? By, by common practice, we uh, get so, it for you, right? They so, get on the ship, and then we're we're responsible for the rest, right? So so there are three three items that the freight forwarder uh, that the that the factory in uh, overseas is doing in an FOB term. A they're bringing it to the freight forwarder's warehouse. 
um, that you determine, they're paying for the export customs clearance, and they are paying the local handling fees. Um, so it's truly you only charge from the air, ocean, uh, freight uh, portion onwards um, that, uh, that that is that is leaving. So um, especially, and this is sometimes something you need to be aware of. Um, here's a pro tip: um, is that some factories. Um, do not have or do not want to have an export license um, because it costs them extra money. Do not pay the export license for them. Tell them that this is their responsibility and check before that they have an export license. Okay. Um, that seems it seems to be like quite a case since maybe half a year, nine months. Um, that they want to put the export license onto the importer. It is the responsibility of the factory to have the export license. Guys, did you hear that? Make sure the factory has the export license. I'm writing this down. This is really, really good. So, several key things that, that are really helpful. You mentioned the FDA attorneys for checking your goods for customs and or for requirements for getting into their country. You mentioned the export license. You mentioned zero to 75 pounds or 70 pounds express like FedEx, UPS, DHL, 75 to 1,000, air freight, 1,000 and above, shipping. This is really helpful. Um, let me ask you this, Philip. The, oh man, I lost the question. Give me one second, man. There's so many questions coming in. I have to scroll back down again. Okay, no problem, Krista. Super glad that was helpful. Guys, um, this is my studio. The other room is my office. So they're, they're both here. Next one we'll do in there. <laughs> but this is the actual studio. That's why it has all this foam here on the walls. It's just better for sound. But the other room is the office. And between you and me, I like the other one better because I like the tree and I like the clock. Um, so to answer your question, guys. Okay. Chris says this, in terms of warranty, Philip, Freitos is not responsible, right? Even if we book through them, the freight forwarder will be the one responsible. Is that correct? That is correct. The, you have the contract with the freight forwarder. Um, and here comes the insurance, insurance point uh, into it. Usually the freight forwarder um, has a very, very low liability. It's a standard liability in the freight industry. It ranges around $2 per kilogram. Um, so, um, and if you want your goods covered uh, for anything above this, you want to include insurance. The insurance is around 0.6% of the goods value. Um, there's usually a minimum of like 25 to $50. Um, and, and, and the insurance covers not only your freight um, and, uh, for loss or for damage, but something, especially in ocean shipping, if this uh, huge vessel uh, runs uh, go, go on ground, uh, and there is a damage not only to 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 the ship, to the vessel itself, but for example, there is like an oil leak and uh, there's an environmental issue. Everyone who has a good on this vessel becomes a part owner of this vessel and is responsibility for wow. the repair. This is like wow. in maritime law, something special very few people know, and the wow. insurance covers for this. So you want to be insured. Uh, well, you want to be insured when, uh, and the insurance is relatively cheap. It's 0.6% of the goods value. So yeah, just include it, you're covered, and for, for, for a few bucks extra, um, you have a complete, complete coverage. So if I don't have insurance, and let's just say there's 100 people with goods on this ship, and that ship goes down, I'm responsible for 1% of those costs. Is that right? Yeah, you're 1% of the cost of like um, salvage and um, uh, rescue. Wow, of salvaging the goods and the cost for doing the rescue. So it's, it could, our, it's our vessel. So, uh, wow. so that yeah. could be a greater cost than the cost of my goods themselves. I had it. I had it once that I had uh, uh, like a pallet, or maybe it wasn't a container on the Hyundai Fortune. Uh, what a name! Um, and uh, wow. they had loaded fireworks in the Gulf of Aden. Um, it, it got on fire, and uh, uh, there was a huge rescue. Um, uh, a rescue a rescue task and the costs of this was a multiple of what the goods of the value were uh, that were in the in the container and wow. the goods the goods were delivered maybe a year later that's unbelievable so, wow yeah. that is good to know just for a moment i want to have some fun with all these inco terms because i think this really relates a lot to to one of the questions one of the questions is um, let me go back to it is oh yeah who is responsible so doesn't doesn't a lot of the responsibility depend on the inco terms and by that just to make sure everyone understands if i'm doing x works free on board free carrier free alongside ship cost and freight cost insurance deliver duty paid all those different inco terms would is this fair to tell me if this is accurate philip are those contractual terms and whichever one we agree to 
that sort of determines who's responsible for what in this entire process. Is that accurate? Yes, the INCO terms are, although they're like, um, as I said before, a little misused, but it's, 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 it's very clearly determines at what point you have the responsibility over the, over the guts, where you take the risk and where you take the, the freight costs. Okay. That, that's no question. If you say, um, and it, it, you can go, you don't need to know all of them. A, you can look them up um, in the internet. There are lots of tables, but very, very simple. Everything that starts with an E or an F, uh, there you have the responsibility uh, from origin, mm -hmm. uh, and everything that starts with a C uh, or with a D, you have the responsibility only when it's when it's at in in the U.S. or wherever you're located or shipping to. So E and F is at origin, and C and D is at destination. Okay, let me make sure I got that right. So E, like X works, means the, the entire responsibility is on the buyer from origin, correct? As well as F. Mm -hmm. Okay. F B F C A um, F A S anything is at origin. Okay. And then nation, you have DDP, DDU, um, CIF, uh, SIP, anything like that. What about DAT? Would there be an exception there for delivered at terminal or no? Or no? no, it's delivered at terminal at uh, destination. Okay, gotcha. That's very helpful. And I remember earlier you mentioned there's a certain letter you try to encourage people not to go with. Was it C? Which one do you say as a general rule we don't recommend it? Well, I mean anything that's uh, basically we do not recommend anything that starts with a C. Um, and the reason why is because Chinese factories have usually their their um, um, their relationships with Chinese freight forwarders, um, and, th and that's a good relationship. It's it's not that that uh, that it's anything against it, but the Chinese freight forwarders then say, I don't want to use an agent in the United States. Uh, it's all up to you. I deliver it only to port in the United States, and it's all up to you. And then it truly starts because you can't just go to the vessel and say, give me my package. I do the rest of my own, right? <laughs> right. Uh, input charges. Um, the entire customs is on you. Um, and this is something the local uh, freight for waters in the United States, A, make very little money on and have very little fun on. Uh, it's, it's something where you, where you have trouble, A, finding a freight for water that's doing a good job. Um, you have very little control over because the, the goods are just brought to the United States. You very, very often do not know when they are coming in and right. you have very little free time in the port. Um, so um, you incur uh, warehousing storage charges uh, because you don't pick up the goods fast enough. Um, so I would shy away from anything that starts with a C. You, you do not save anything by doing this. Uh, we've made this ex exception. Either go the full way DD DDP uh, and have no control over it or go with an ENF, meaning XWorks, FOB, and have full control over it um, uh, from, from origin. Gotcha. That's super helpful. Dollar says this, for sellers outside of the U.S., is the forwarder able, and I'm assuming, Dollar, you're referring to selling in the U.S., so you want your goods to be shipped to a warehouse in the U.S., because there's other places like Germany and soon-to-be Australia and France and Spain where you also can send your products to a warehouse. But the question is, is the forwarder able to check and prepare the stock before they send to Amazon? Um, so it, what it sounds like you're referring to here, Dollar, Dollar is a third-party service that will do that for you. The forwarder's job isn't to check the stock. Correct me if I'm wrong, Philip, unless there's exceptions here that I don't know about. Their job is to ship it safely to its destination, but they don't actually pick up the actual box and say, you know, okay, here's the box, make sure the label's good, it's good condition. Like, there aren't forwarders who do that, correct? Well, the forwarder's responsibility is, A, to check the count of the boxes. If on the pay, on the bill of lading it says 50 boxes and there are 49, then obviously they, uh, they have to <laughs> notify this. The right. second thing, if there are any holes, any damages, outside damages to the to the box, it's also the forwarder's reliability um, to check this because um, Amazon will refuse it. And when Amazon refuses it, with, for example, wet, uh, the forwarder doesn't want to have a liability that uh, they're saying, you know, like it passes backwards, that they're saying, you know, we received a drive and it got wet to Amazon, so obviously you know where it was. So they want to sign off on clear paper. Right. However, if you need, for example, the box open and see what's the condition inside um, or, or do a count, um, then you need to do with a fulfillment, you go with a fulfillment service, and there are multiple, just Google. Um, we also have some we work with at Freitos, um, and, and, and we can recommend you some. At Freitos, we do not do this, uh, we do not offer this at the moment. We're a true marketplace. Uh, but they are really good fulfillment services in the United States. 
Yeah, very good. And I'll include a link for you guys as well where you can get 72 different prep centers, just a whole list of them that you can pick through and decide if you want to work with one who does that. So just for clarity, guys, as Philip said, they do the count. They have to make sure the goods are in good condition as far as not being wet, but they don't go inside the box and look at your good and make sure the label's good and all of that. That's where you would need a prep center. Um, Kristen or Krista says, um, should I worry that they would screw it up if I have the supplier put the FNSQU code on the packaging? Um, Nine-year gold supplier, I wouldn't worry about it, Krista, but I would ask them to send you a few photos of a few samples where they actually printed it to show it to you, and then you can compare that to the FNSKU number inside your Seller Central account. Um, MJJ says, exactly what I did. I received my first order today. I tested the goods. Everything looks and works perfect. That's awesome. MJJ, congratulations. Um, or Fernando says, at Dollar, some forwarders do provide that service. It's a matter of asking and making a few phone calls or email. Renee says, thank you, Fernando. I'm going to keep going. Okay, Dan Danielle, or Daniel. Hey Seth, I'm buying from a supplier and my products are sets of 40 on each carton. And there will be eight cartons, but one carton, Philip, this may be a question for you, will come with only 20 pieces. What should I do? Okay, this is a question for me. You might answer it too. Amazon will figure it. So when you ship them out, make sure if you're shipping them directly to Amazon's warehouse, it's, you're gonna say on there how many are in each carton, how many are in each box. So you're able to tell them so they know exactly what to expect when they get it. They know how many in this box. They know how many are in this box. If you set it up correctly, that shouldn't be a problem, Daniel. Um, yeah, they, to, to add to this, um, we always ask for, uh, wait, after booking, we ask you for the origin uh, uh, contact details, the destination contact details, which you have at your factory and wherever you're shipping it to, um, and then the commercial invoice. And this is the key part, is the packing list. And the packing list makes it very, very, very clear, box A, this amount of pieces, uh, this amount of goods, box B, and they're described. So it's very, even if a box has, all boxes have different pieces, uh, it doesn't really matter. The packing list describes it beautifully. Hmm. Excellent. And Lynn, don't worry, this is recorded as well. So once it's done, it'll take about 10 minutes. It'll be on the YouTube channel where you can go back and watch this as well. And um, just so you guys know, Just One Dime Warriors, um, after this, um, we are going to, Philip and I are going to continue to meet and we're going to do an in-depth training on all of this, much more in-depth with a presentation and a slideshow and everything that we're going to offer to you guys as well, 100% free. So just want you guys to know that we're providing very in-depth training after this and that won't be public. That'll just be for Just One Dime Warriors. Okay, um, what does the $500 annual bond Freitos cover and not cover? Let me give it a shot at this and tell me if I'm right, Philip. So the last I checked, it was around 600 and it, it, was in, it was a bond for the entire year, which is different. So that basically covers you for anything for that whole year versus a one-time bond for one shipment. Is that correct, Philip? Yeah, and it is, it, is 500, it is $500, and it covers you for, it's not a Freitas bond, it's a bond from, from US Customs, uh, and it covers you for 12 months. It's not one calendar year, it's for 12 months um, of any, any shipping um, you bring into the United States. Um, and that is a so-called continuous bond. It's nothing that we invented at Freitas. It's a standard uh, bond that uh, is issued by custom, US Customs. Gotcha. So this is a government thing that they created. And we have to go by it. Um, Tyler Drew says, really good question. He says, so Philip, the rule of thumb for Air Express is still around 5.5 per kilogram, right? Five point five and a half dollars per kilogram. Yeah, five and a half dollar per kilogram uh, depends a little bit. Uh, it's 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 rather low. It's probably when you ship from Shanghai straight to uh, Los Angeles. If you go, for example, to Juliet uh, in 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 uh, in the Chicago area or somewhere with Western towns, then it's probably rather to um, seven dollar per kilogram. So anything between five and seven dollar. Okay. So just to restate that, guys, between five and seven dollars per kilogram is what you should expect for Air Express. And then also there's that calculated weight based on the size, right? Where something could be lighter, but if it's bigger, that still comes into play and causes it to weigh more. Yeah, yeah, you have a volume, we have, a, I mean, it gets a little uh, deep now, I uh, hope everyone still appreciates it, but you have a so-called volume weight and a chargeable weight, so, um, and then the gross weight, the actual weight. So let's assume you have a box of feathers and a box of stones, uh, both are uh, one cubic meter, uh, one meter by one meter by one meter. Um, one weighs um, basically 100 kilograms, the other one weighs uh, 1,000 kilograms. 
right? It's very, very simple. The feathers, one cubic meter, weigh 100 kilograms. The stones weigh 1,000 kilograms. Um, what you just do is basically um, uh, the, the, the box uh, of feathers um, is then multiplied by 167, which is the chargeable weight uh, of the goods. So it's not you're not charged 100 kilograms, but 167 kilograms. Um, and then the the stones are valued at 1,000 kilogram. Whatever is more expensive. Um, so uh, in the volume weights, the volume weight is more expensive, so you get charged by volume weight. And the um, stones, it's the actual weight. And uh, what you then go by is called the chargeable weight. So the feathers would not be 100 kilogram, but 167 kilograms. The stones, although it's also one cubic meter, it will be still 1,000 kilograms that you pay. That, that was the best explanation I've ever heard of it. Could not explain it better. I've heard many people explain it, and that is not an easy one. So thank you. And I'm going to restate it just so everyone understands. If you're buying a box of rocks, okay, <laughs> and there might be something wrong with you if you're buying a box of rocks, I don't know why, but let's just say you got this box of rocks right here, and then you buy another box of feathers, so you got both, okay? Your box of rocks will be based on the actual weight. The box of feathers will be, um, help me out here, man, 167 times... The, 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 the cubic meter, the volume. So the you volume. take 167, right. 167 times whatever the cubic meters are, um, and then you have the kilograms that it's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the chargeable weight. Got it. So this actually, comparatively weight, this is actually spending a little more for the weight because it's a lot lighter, but they're still charging you for the volume because volume matters, not just weight, when it's going on an airplane or a ship, and that's called your chargeable weight. So guys, just so you understand, don't feel like they're screwing you over. If, man, this is really light, how come it's so expensive? Well, they're going to charge more because there's volume, and they're going to pick whichever one is higher. So super helpful, Philip. Um, so the other part of Tyler's question, I think this is Tyler, it says T. Drew, is my supplier is telling me that exchange rates are up, so Air Express is going up. Is that BS? What was the question again? It's like okay, it's... No problem. He said, my supplier is telling me that the exchange rates are high. They're up. So Air Express is also going up. Is that true? What do you think of that? That might be right. Like, <laughs> it's uh, I don't want to judge by just one statement, not knowing anyone uh, that this is BS. But uh, it's not a common argument <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing. So, <laughs> let's put that way. That's what so you should challenge, challenge us a little bit and compare it to other providers. There's so many providers out there. Just judge, yeah. uh, compare it with someone else. There you go. Because if you compare it and everyone's saying about the same thing, you know it's legit, right, Tyler? Yeah. So that's awesome. And here's the beauty of it, guys. And just so you know, I don't have some business contract deal partnership with Freitos. Okay, we didn't sign a contract, and I want to bring you guys value. And Freitos knows what they're doing. But if you go to their website, you literally try. It. It's really fun. Some of you guys, and just when I'm have done it, you just type in exactly what you're trying to do: the, the origination, the destination, um, the type of product, just all the details, and it'll automatically give you quotes. And you can see which freight forward it's recommending based on those quotes. That right there alone is going to be a very helpful way to understand the cost. And remember, these costs are not inflated because you're using their service. The way Freightos gets paid is from the supply, the freight forwarders. In other words, Freightos is saying, hey, I'll bring you guys business. So therefore, the freight forwarders are paying Freightos. Does that make sense, you guys? Therefore, you aren't being charged more. That's what I like about you guys' program is you're not taking a cut into these people working so hard to sell on Amazon, but obviously you need to get paid because you guys are providing a very legitimate expensive service. So that's yeah, and one more, one more thing is if you come to our website, we have a chat function. Just bear with us on a Saturday. Uh, that way we're responding to everyone right in time. Uh, we will respond to you. Um, we are there uh, with very, very good service from Monday to Friday, um, also on Sundays. Just Saturdays is usually a day uh, where we don't, we're not at the moment not so well staffed. Um, just because it's a weekend and usually businesses aren't aren't working. So type your question uh, and we'll definitely respond to you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. And and thank you, Karen, for your comment. Um, she says thank you for having Philip on. This has been super helpful, Philip. Um this this these questions you're answering are burning questions for people. People need to understand. The more they understand, the more confidence they can have when they're out there trying to succeed on Amazon and online. So thank you so much for the answers you provide. Is there any final advice you would give to everyone before we close this interview? 
Yeah, I mean, the final advice just is, is, it sounds complicated. At the end, it's very easy. I would say try it out because many, many have tried it out already and saw that they were very happy and very successful and uh, made a ton of money on it. So it sounds complicated, it isn't. Yeah, very good. Hey, thank you so much, Philip. Um, I will talk to you shortly after. Everyone, have an awesome rest of your day. And for those of you guys who asked, if you're interested in receiving further training that will be pre-recorded interview with Philip, when you buy into our bundle, it becomes part of it. We continually increase the value of this program to help you succeed. So for those of you guys who are saying, hey, I want to join the coaching program, a year of coaching, four hours every week, live coaching, videos, people from multiple countries, we're in 67 different countries, ideas and ways to legitimately get reviews on your products, um, market niche ideas that are set to you to help de-risk you as much as possible. Uh, there's so much more. Uh, those of you guys who are part of it, you already know, a full website built for you. Make sure you remember when you do that, you will also get pre-recorded training from Philip that goes much deeper than this interview. But either way, success to you guys is what I wish you and I hope you have an awesome rest of your Saturday. Philip, thank you again, brother. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. See you.